Okay. I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Um, and I'm going to talk today about um, Theodore W. Allen and Hubert Harrison, who I believe are two of the most important thinkers and writers on race and class in the 20th century. They are autodidacts, self-educated, working class intellectuals, right? Harrison never goes to college a day in his life. Allen goes one day and found it too confining. He discusses Euro-Indian relations throughout the Americas and certain particularities in terms of whether it's a continental colony, social stratification, how um, the, the Spanish could come and take advantage of the hierarchy of the uh, Aztecs and Incas, you know, to uh, put them to work and maintain control, population density. But the key difference, and this is crucial for understanding that virulent white supremacy that develops here, is England alone, of all the European colonizing powers, was exporting European labors. This is crucial, the demographics, right? So, he talks about African migration to the Americas and points out what people may not be familiar with, that more Africans than Europeans come to the Americas between 1500 and 1800. He also points out the role of African resistance and key keys in on the Haitian Revolution, its impact on the British West Indies, the US, Cuba, and Brazil. And he also makes the very important point that it was from Haiti that Simon Bolivar twice goes to regroup before he goes on his liberation efforts in Latin America. So it brings those ties and connections together. Allen discusses the Virginia car, uh, Charter. It's set up, it's kind of supposed to have all the rights you know, that they had in England. Um, it's capitalist basis, he goes through you know, stocks, you know, what people owned and all that. It's clearly capitalism, and why I'm emphasizing this, it's not simply the relations of production which he goes into and the financial interest, but it's not feudalism. Some people would say, you know, this is a feudal carryover. We're talking capitalism. Um, plantations were capitalist enterprises, production monopolized by one class. They start developing the plantations in between 1610 and 16, after 1614, 1616. Um, the Powhatan, the Native Americans in the area of Jamestown were well provisioned in the first decade or two, uh, the preponderance of force. Uh, the English lacked the preponderance of force to you know, really do very much in terms of pushing them out or anything like that. In the early period, there's some intermediate forms of uh, bond servitude uh, that the uh, plantation elite, they start bringing convicts, vagrants, maids for wives, and duty boys. This is 1618, this is before the first Africans still, right? First Africans come 1619, he discusses that. Whatever their status was on the high seas, when they get to Virginia, they're not slaves because there's no slavery in Virginia. Um, key date, 22nd March, 1622. They don't teach this one. <coughs> On this day, the Powhatan Indians in the area of Jamestown rise up and they kill one third of the colonists in one day. And in the next year, another one third die. Right? Now, and there's the struggle. Now, what this sets up is what today people would, might call uh, a shock doctrine scenario, right? Because the ruling elite seizes on the vulnerability. The main food was corn. Corn grows high, they couldn't go out more than 50 feet or something beyond the confines of the fort to get supplies. So the ruling elite who controlled the supplies started imposing a new category on laborers. There had been free laborers, apprentices, uh, tenants at half where they kept half of what they produced, all these capitalist relations to production. But after 1622, you see appearing in the records that people could be bought and sold to the heirs and they could be assigned to other people. They call it the custom of the country, and that's the phrase you see in the book. Just like they, they later, with a sneer, would refer to their peculiar institution, the slave owners, or, or how they wouldn't put it in the Constitution, you know, the slave. So they called it the custom of the country, but it was chattelization of labor, buying and selling labor. Right? And Alan discusses how this happens. It's a break from the statute of artificers. It is not a feudal carryover. It's imposed as the custom of the country. Here are the statistics, and you've never seen these before. When I was in high school, I was taught about the Oh, way back, there were Negro slaves and white indentured servants. They weren't white. They're not indentured. Look at these statistics. Three quarters were chattel bond laborers. 
That's not signing an indenture in England and willingly putting yourself in this status. This is being imposed. Allen points out, such recruitment was generally coercive. Few were wholehearted volunteers. Many were kidnapped convicts, others, right? and there's no, when I say that phrase, there also is still not slavery, and there's not racial slavery yet in Virginia in this period. All right, so four chattel bond laborers, and someone raised questions, uh, Again, Allen gets, does a nice job on a number of gender issues, but here he talks about the denial of family life. And there was more serious penalties, particularly on women, if they're chattel bond laborer, because the owner, your owner, wants work out of you, right? And if you're getting pregnant, you're not doing it. So there were laws passed against fornication, adultery, and the penalties were invariably harsher on the women than on the men, right? Um, women were exposed to special oppression attacks Children of, uh, of chattel bond laborers were considered illegitimate. 17th century Virginia, Allen makes this point. Morgan, to a degree, makes this point. Edmund Morgan, Lerone Bennett Jr. makes this point. The conditions for European and African American bond laborers was very similar in this period. As Bennett says, it was no Garden of Eden. They were lucky if they finished three years. This was hard conditions, but there was much similarity in their conditions, right? Um, Yes, chattel means you could be bought and sold. They, traditionally, the way it was set up, you, you would be uh, the chattel of someone. Uh, you might be, have a, a service of four. You're a woman, you might have five years, you know. They, they would do it. The Irish sometimes they would do more African Americans. As we saw, they would sometimes try and extend it. But you could be bought and sold as a business proposition. I could pass you on to my children, my cousin, whatever, right? Your property. All right. Status of African Americans in the 17th century. Most people are not familiar with this. If you own property, and some did, some did, you could exercise marriage rights. You could, you, there was social mobility. Some had significant land holdings. Some were owners of European American laborers. Manifested many forms of resistance. Some could vote. And this becomes very important later. All right. So Allen argues the status of African Americans in this period was indeterminate because it's still being struggled out, right? And see, with, these, with this plantation economy, the big problem was for the elite was how they're going to maintain social control. People chattel, they want to run away. There's lots. There's a number of attempts to uh, up, uh, ins insurgents to run away. Um, very key case, getting into gender issues again, and particularly the black family, but much deeper issues too. Case of Elizabeth Key. Elizabeth Key is a woman, a child of a European American father and an African American mother. She was scheduled to complete her servitude when the estate she was bonded on sought to impose permanent lifetime st uh, status on her. Elizabeth Key goes to court because she could go to court back then. This changes, right? She goes to court. That's a rendition of Elizabeth Key. And she makes two arguments. One, that she had been baptized. Sometimes that one would work. Not always, right? Sometimes. But the second argument is crucial. She argues the common law principle. The, the, the law in England for centuries was the status of the child followed that of the status of the father. The Latin phrase, partus secretor patrum. Status of the child follows that of, of the father. For, for centuries, this was the law. And if those principles prevailed, we wouldn't have had what later developed because the offspring of these, the, of these chattel laborers would be not chattel laborers, right? If it went after the father or... But in 1662, the Virginia Assembly realized, boy, that's not the way we, we want to start taking this thing, and they changed the law, and um, they go to partis sequitur venture, and the status of the child follows the status of the mother. Now, that's key also. When I was in school years ago, there was a book by a fellow named Gutman, I think it was Gutman, The Black Family in Slavery and Freedom. And that book starts in 1790. But you can't really address this issue if you don't go back and look at some of this stuff. All right. So Allen's arguing in this period still the white race did not exist. He emphasizes the invention of the white race cannot be ascribed to demands by European labor. They weren't demanding Africans be enslaved or anything like this. They were, you know. So it's coming from on high. He discusses the, the uh, trade in African labor. Another factor why there were so many English coming is because the Dutch were controlling the trade from Africa, and the trade routes would go to the Caribbean, but they're not coming up to Virginia particularly. So the numbers of 
European chattel bond laborers continued. Here in this period, 1680, 70, 30,000 uh, European Americans came, 24,000 were bond laborers. They still hadn't had the full turn to African labor yet, right? All right. Bacon's Rebellion, we went through that. That's the big struggle. Jamestown burning. The problem of social control in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion. And Bacon's Rebellion had been preceded by 10 laboring class and bond servants revolts. This issue of social control was major. The problem of social control was solved by the invention of the white race. And Alan goes through this and how it gets codified in law. The codification of white supremacy, a new social status was to be contrived. White identity to set European American laborers not only at a distance from African Americans, but also to enlist them as supporters of the plantation bourgeoisie, right? Um, so he goes through the codification of these privileges, and he talks about the presumption of liberty, the right to get married. As a chattel monster, you couldn't get married, so these things, see, they were rights in England, but they're no longer rights in Virginia, but now they get extended, but as privileges, racial privileges, because they're only as, as extended to the white, not to the Af Africans, right? There's also laws against free Africans, and they start imposing these, and this, you know, barring from witness, can't serve in the militia, can't resist, uh, forbidding uh, to be owners of bond laborers, et cetera, and he lists all of these. They also, and this is crucial, I think, for this day still, they propagandize the people. They gotta teach the people their way, and they gotta teach the people this in their interest. So how do they do it? In that day, the principal means of uh, mass communication were putting it on the church doors and the courthouse doors, right? And they were doing it, so they propagandized people. 1723, there's a key law passed. No free Negro, mulatto, or Indian whatsoever shall have any vote in the election. This is passed in Virginia. In England, they don't understand it. They say, well, if somebody owns property, why can't they vote, vote right? So Go Gooch, who's the governor of Virginia, breaks it down. He breaks it down, and he writes to England, and he says, we did it to fix a perpetual brand on free Negroes and mulattoes. So what Allen argues, convincingly, I think, is that it's a deliberate act by the bourgeoisie. Surely that was no unthinking decision, which is a reference to Winter Jordan, the one, the one he wants to challenge. All right, almost done. All right, now this one is important. Why the exclusion of free African Americans? And this, we have components and aspects of this today. Uh, there was a marked tendency to promote a pride of race among white people. The real reason the exclusion of African Americans was a corollary of the establishment of white identity. When you're excluding black, that goes into how you, ident how you identify and define white. The Act of 1723 also um, denies the right of self-defense to African Americans, which has devastating effects on the African American family. Allen points out that, and he goes through statistics, that the laborers were not promoted out of their class, and he goes through the statistics on that. He argues, as he ends volume two, that white race social control formation that's established in Virginia gets spread throughout the South, and then ultimately goes nationwide. His last book, in, towards a revolution in labor history is 2004, and he goes into, he wants to probe more deeply um, labor history, he, the question of white identity. He argues slavery was capitalism, all of the things which we've discussed before, but he challenges the great, what he calls the great white assumption, the unquestioning, indeed, unthinking acceptance of the white identity of European Americans as a natural attribute rather than a social construct. He emphasizes white race as ruling class social control formation. Um, he recommends taking up four struggles for the generations here today. In the future, this is in his last year, 2004, before he dies. Work to show that white supremacism is not inherited. Demonstrate that white supremacism has not served the interest of the European American laborers. Account for the prevalence. How do you explain? Let's address that. And by the light of history, consider ways whereby European American laboring people may cast off the stifling incubus of white identity. And key to what Allen does in that last unfinished work is he starts U.S. labor history from the premise that black labor was proletarian. And he says, from that else, all else follows and changes, right? Um, so as we close, I encourage you to remember the insights of Hubert Harrison. Politically, the Negro is a touchstone of the modern democratic 
uh, idea. And true democracy and equality implies a revolution that's startling to even think of. Remember from Allen, right race created and maintained as a ruling class social control formation, principal historic guarantor of ruling class uh, domination of national life. Uh, white supremacy reinforced by white privilege, the main retardant of class conscious efforts at radical social change have to take on that white supremacy. Remember the three previous crises, learn the lesson of history, let's not keep making these mistakes. We know what they're coming at us with, what they're coming at us with, you know, and we've got to be able to beat them back on that. Remember the most vulnerable point, it's what they rely on, but it's what we can beat them on. Um, remember the five stage cycle. Remember the importance of anti-white supremacist struggle in all stages, particularly from three through five. And remember the need for you all, the proletarian generation of the future that sees the leadership in these struggles to guarantee that we beat them back. Thank you very much. It's actually the work of Theodore W. Allen, right? I, um, I write about Allen. I have his papers, which I'm indexing and inventorying. And Allen's basic argument, for people who are not familiar with it, is as follows. Uh, he wrote two books in, on that subject, two-volume work, in 1994 and 1997. And they've been reprinted by Verso Books last four, about four months ago, late, in late 2012. And I did a lot of the new supplemental material for it. And on the back cover of the first volume, Allen wrote that when the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, nor would there be for another 60 years. And he points out, and he did this, he, Allen was a, an autodidact, a self-educated, working class, intellectual, anti-white supremacist scholar. And uh, he spent over 20 years going through primary records in Virginia. So he bases his statement, when he says there are no white people there, he's pointing to the fact that the word white doesn't appear in any Virginia colonial records until 1691. And he went through 885 county years of records. That is, you take the counties that existed at that time in Virginia, all the records for one year is a county year. And so it's very thorough research he did. And the word doesn't appear. Uh, and it's not simply that the word doesn't appear, as we know it, you know, it's a symbol of so social status, but he argues, based on the records, that the white race, as we know it, was not functioning. Um, and when I say based on the records, he went through the records, but he's, he's a working class person, and he's looking from that eye, so he paid particular attention to wherever men or women, African, European, had, had a voice in any hearings, in any colonial record. And he actually went to these county courthouses and to the Virginia State Library and transcribed these. And then he'd come back and type them up at night. And these are all these records. I have thousands of pages, right? And uh, so not, he, he argues that the word didn't appear, but the white race wasn't functioning. And he goes through all different areas of civil life, civilian life. He might just have someone's name. Um, or in the case of John Punch, uh, I used this example recently. Um, there was a lot of uh, attention paid some months ago when it was found out that Barack Obama was related to a man named John Punch who ran away with two cohorts in 1640. They were all trying to escape their bondage, right? Their, their limited term bond servitude. And um, he runs away and uh, the two people he's, he runs away with in that record uh, he's not described, uh, John Punch is described as Negro, and he runs away with Victor, uh, a, a Dutchman and a Scotsman named J James Gregory. So it could be English, could be Dutch, could be Scot. Most of the people were English in the colony. There weren't so many Africans in this early period. The big turn to African labor only begins in, in Virginia. The, and Virginia is the uh, pattern-setting plantation colony. That's why it's so important. I think seven of the first 12 presidents come from Virginia. Um, so the Royal African Company is found in the 1670s, and still for the remainder of the century, there are more European than African bond laborers coming into the U.S. So people oftentimes are not familiar with that. At the time of Bacon's Rebellion, which is another account um, where a fellow named Thomas Grantham puts down the big joint struggle of European and African American laborers, he talks about encountering English 
and Negroes in arms, you know, ready to cut them up and chop them to pieces and demanding their freedom from bondage. And um, they're joint because they're, they're, they're all chattel bond servants. At the time of Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, three quarters of the chattel bond servants in Virginia were European American. A chattel bond servant is someone uh, in the early period, and chattel bond servant isn't brought from England. Uh, again, England had gone through centuries of struggle from people fr from below. And in 1563, the uh, established labor law for England, which was to prevail for the next 250 uh, years, statute of artifices, you know, was formulated and, and passed. And two key provisions where there would be no slavery and w workers would be paid wages, right? And uh, that's what the colonists from England brought when they found Jamestown in the early uh, 1600s. And that's what's the law in, in um, Virginia. Um, until roughly 1622, there were some intermediate forms. Uh, they turned to tobacco in 1616. That's the big cash crop which the plantations start to really, you know, b get built to produce, right? Um, but in 1622, in, in 1619, 1620, there were some efforts to take advantage of vulnerable populations in England and ship them to Virginia under more oppressive conditions. There's maids for wives. There are women who are brought, you know, to get matched with men, you know, and um, there's duty boys who are youngsters, you know, who are supposed to serve for a while, you know, before they'll be free. But uh, the basic relations of production, if you will, in Virginia, in this early period, a typical capitalist relations of production. And for the laborers at the bottom of society, that means tenants it has where they keep half of what they produce and they turn over half or wage laborers. But on 22nd March, 1622, there's a major attack on the Jamestown settlement by the Powhatan Native, the Native Americans in the area. And they write, wipe out one third of the colony in one day. And within the next year, another third dies. And it's very precarious existence now for the colonists. Um, they can't even go very far beyond the confines of the fort to grow, you know, and, and there are actually laws passed prohibiting growing of corn, which is the main thing they ate, because it could provide cover, you know, for people ready to attack. Um, so it puts the laboring people who have not, nothing and don't really have access not only to, to land and, and tools, you know, but they don't have access to supplies to live on. So it puts them in a very vulnerable position. And the ruling elite in Virginia at that time do what we have seen over the next few centuries. It's uh, Naomi Klein talks about uh, implementing kind of a shock doctrine. They impose a new category of labor on these laboring people who are free, free wage earners or tenants at half. And it's chattel bond servitude, right? And I'll explain exactly what that is in a second, but chattel is property, right? And bond servitude, you, people now being forced to serve three, four, five years at first like that, when they can try and get away with extending it to six or seven years in the case of, case of women or Irish, you know, they would do it, right? But chattel, and this is a qualitative change from England. In the, in the Virginia records, you'll see it referred to as the, quote, excuse me, uh, custom of the country, right? Uh, a lot of people in this country have been taught in the schools, oh, they are indentured servants, right? And they saw, as if they signed indentures in England. This is being imposed in Virginia by a ruling elite on a vulnerable, mostly European population as the custom of the countries. It is not a feudal carryover. It's not, it's not a carryover from feudalism. In feudalism, there's a two-way bondage. The, you know, serf has responsibility to, to the lord, and the lord has responsibility to serf. This is a one-way bondage in which the bond servant can be bought and sold like property. They have, right? So it's qualitatively different, imposed primarily on European Americans at first. It's limited term chattel bond servitude is what Alan describes it as and very accurately. And it really begins in, 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 in large scale from 1622 on. And throughout the 17th century in Virginia, and that's the principal, as I said, plantation colony at that time, um, the majority of the laboring population and the majority of people who come to Virginia come as, ch you know, they're chattel bond servants. Again, people are not familiar with that. And the African-American population is still relatively small, as I said, but conditions for chattel bond servants were very oppressive. A lot of them didn't live out there three, four, or five years. And um, so there was much similarity. And for African Americans and European Americans, they did what normal people would do under those conditions. 
They fought together, they ran away together, they resisted, they made love, they functioned as normal human beings. Um, conditions were also particularly oppressive for women um, in that period, and there were laws, because again, a more vulnerable group, you know, and they would, there'd be harsher penalties on some things. In this early period, when it's limited chattel bond servitude, there, is, there are also laws against fornication or adultery, People are not allowed to have these relations because if a woman gets pregnant, that's time off from work, right? You only have five years. So particularly when you have limited term bond servitude. So these were, were uh, violations, I mean, punishable by whippings and, you know, sentencing to extra servitude and things like this. And Alan pays particular attention to these things. And throughout his book, I mean, his antennas are up on qu questions of white supremacy as it develops on male oppression. I think readers will find much in here. And I've, I've tried to make it a point in the index to help point them to a lot of material. And in new editions of the books, we have 25-page internal study guides in each volume. Um, but the, what I just mentioned about the um, fornication and adultery, Alan treats these as forms of resistance in this early period. It's very interesting, as well as petitioning in court, you know, things where, you know, the, the avenues that people had to resist. Um, later on, and I mentioned in a very significant case, which it's good for, I think, students of labor history to be aware of, is um, the Elizabeth Key case. And very briefly, Elizabeth Key is a woman whose uh, father was European, mother was African, of African descent, and she's a, a limited-term bond servant. And there, there was some question, her parents die, and the people who had title to her uh, service, right, uh, wanted to extend her to lifetime bond servitude. You know, again, if they'll try and extend things when they can. And she goes into court using the right of petition, right, which was available. She's African-American by our definition. Well, she is African-American. And she goes to court and petitions on two grounds. She had been baptized, and there was some tradition where baptism meant people could not be sentenced to lifetime bond servitude. Um, but the other thing that she argues is that it's English common law, partus sequitur, forgive my Latin, patrum, descent follows the status of the father. And that's the common law in England for centuries. And she prevails. She prevails, right? And But six years later, Virginia, the plantation owners say, this isn't the way we want to go, because later on, when, particularly as they turn to racial slavery, they want those children of these women who, who are being taken advantage of by owners or overseers or whatever, they want their children to be lifetime bond servitude. So, so there's a qualitative change, and they switch in 1662, descent following the status of the father to descent following the status of the mother. It's a qualitative change in laws, which people who study family and gender relations in this country should know. I mean, this is very, very significant. Um, and that's how it, pre it went in Virginia. So what happens now with under these similar conditions, and there's a historian named Lerone Bennett Jr. who people may be familiar with. He was senior editor of Ebony Magazine for many, many years. He wrote before the Mayflower, which a lot of people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, were familiar with. One of his early books is The Shaping of Black America, Chapter 3. And in that book, he describes not with all the primary sources that Allen had, but I don't think Bennett had access to all the primary sources that Allen did. He describes conditions very similar to what Allen describes, how conditions were very similar for European American, not, not, not great conditions, right? They're pretty oppressive, but there was much commonality of experience. And between 1660, when the price of tobacco takes a dive, and 1676, when Bacon's Rebellion starts, um, there are over 10 laboring class and bond servant revolts in Virginia, right? So it's a period of increased turmoil and labor solidarity. And so what Allen then argues, whereas there was no white race in the beginning and people were not identified as white, they were English, French, Angolan, sometimes Negro, sometimes Angolan, you know, it depends on who's writing the records, too. Um, uh, Allen argues that after Bacon's Rebellion, in Bacon's Rebellion, it starts out, I won't go into great detail on this, but Allen does, um, as a struggle between the elite and the sub-elite over the rate of expropriation of the Native American population. Uh, essentially, as is so often the case, the ruling elite likes things the way they are, and they try to main they actually try to maintain friendly relations with neighboring uh, Native American tribes because they would help control runaways, right? They would have agreements on that. Whereas the new plantation owners on the make, the up-and-coming 
and plantation owners, they wanted more access to land for to expand plantations and larger plantations. So they took a much more aggressive policy. So Bacon's Rebellion starts as an elite sub-elite struggle over a rate of expropriation of land from Native Americans. But in the latter stages, the second Civil War stages, it turns into, as often happens, a struggle which engages the people from below, and that's those who make up Bacon's army. Bacon dies, but they, they go on and they push their demands, the, the labor, uh, chattel bond servants and free laborers supporting them, demanding freedom from bondage, one of the principal demands. And um, in Bacon's Rebellion, they kick out the governor, they burn Jamestown, and the rebels control six-seventh of the colony for about nine months. It's a very significant struggle. Um, in the wake of that, the ruling elite decides they have to devise a means of social control. Um, two of Allen's main themes in his work are that the capitalists in this case, you know, the plantation bourgeoisie, um, have two principal tasks. They want to make money, they want to make profit, but they have to maintain social control. And he pay, focuses particular attention on how they maintain social control. Um, volume one of his two-volume work is racial oppression and social control, right? So uh, it's central to his understanding, and that's, he thinks that's a key to understanding what happens. So in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion, and this is Allen's main thesis, he says that the plantation bourgeoisie in Virginia invented the white race as a ruling class social control formation, right? Uh, it serves ruling class interests. It's coming from above to serve their interests. And then he goes on, he's got two corollaries. One is that they did this by implementing a system of racial privileges extended towards the European Americans, white race privileges. And at the same time, they instituted a, or they started developing a system of racial oppression. And he make, makes some clear distinction on what he means by racial oppression. The title of his second volume, which details this, is The Origin of Racial Oppression in Anglo-America. And when he talks about racial oppression, what is key to racial oppression is how social control is maintained. And it is by laboring people of the oppressor group over the oppressed in this case, this what we would call a race, right? The oppressed race. As opposed to in the Caribbean, what develops, for instance, is a key in, uh, uh, ingredient in social control are from the oppressed group, right? Because the, the demographics are very different, different history of class struggle. He goes into all of this. But so Alan says the, sec the corollary was that the uh, white race is invented by implementing a system of racial privileges and developing a system of racial oppression. Very key to the racial oppression was not only the lifetime bond servitude of African Americans, not all of them, though, you know, of overwhelming majority, but the attacks on free African Americans, which I'll get into in a second. That's crucial to understanding racial oppression. But the third point he makes, which is so important and so distinguishes his work and is so central, I think, for labor history, is that not only was this system of racial oppression and racial slavery um, harmful for African Americans across the board, right, but that it was also ruinous to the interest of laboring class European Americans, right? He, clearly, he sees it's in the interest of the ruling elite but for laboring people, this was not the way to go. You know, what, what was far better was that solidarity between European Americans and African Americans. But what the uh, plantation elite was able to do in Virginia when they created this white race was to, and then they had to propagandize it. They put it on the church. He, he details again all of this. They put it on the church uh, doors, and they, the sheriffs are posting it, the means of mass communication of the day. And they're constantly indoctrinating people in it, and there's penalties for doing things. You know, it's a process. White identity is nothing natural. I mean, pe right. people were not white. Alan's very clear. The push for the, for the invention of the white race and the push for racial slavery was coming from the plantation bourgeoisie. He says this was not a demand coming from the Euro, uh, European American laboring people, right? And he, and he goes through instance after instance. And what I would encourage people to do is really engage his work. It's a life's work. It's his magnum opus. It's 800 pages. It's 35 percent documented primary foot source footnotes, notes. It's, it's, a, it's a major work, and what I, I appreciate about Alan's work, amongst other things, and I'm a historian, um, is that um, he works outside the academy. He's an independent scholar, and I call it good independent proletarian scholar. So he has great integrity in his work, um, and even when he, ra he knows what the counter-arguments are, so he tries to raise them in their best light, 
and then address them in a serious and meaningful way, right? And so for people who are interested in matters of race and class, I think it's a wonderful building block, you know, uh, for any future work. I, uh, already, if people go to my web page, uh, I have um, almost 60 quotes from scholars and activists, which are staggering in terms of their praise of Allen and very important scholars already referring to, it's, to the work as a classic. You know, it's a classic. Um, and it's just uh, uh, the task is to get more people to engage it and become familiar with it because, I, again, I'm quite convinced it's a major building block for understanding U.S. labor history. What I wanted to speak about before for a second, aside from the point that Alan makes, I think, rather convincingly that this demand was not coming from the laboring uh, class European Americans, is um, the two main arguments, when he's arguing that it's ruinous uh, to the interest also of European American workers as well as to African Americans, he winds up taking on two main arguments. And these arguments are crucial, I think, uh, in terms of labor history and in terms of working people, understanding their own history and struggling forward. And he takes on what are the two main arguments um, that undermine struggle against white supremacy by European Americans. And the two main arguments are one, that racism, whatever we call it, white supremacism, is innate. Because if it's innate, why would we fight against it? You know, it's always going to be that way. Be the same if, you know, if a shoe was on the other foot. Well, all these arguments. And the second argument is that white workers, quote, benefit from white supremacism or racism. And if they benefit from it, why should they oppose it, right? And those are the two main arguments. And I've 33 years actively in the trade union movement and continue to be active as a retiree. Um, so, I, you know, and I've been raising this issue for all that time. And I'm pretty familiar with what the arguments are and what we have to go against. And Alan, one of his major contributions is to historically challenge both those. Now, in terms of history of the colonial period, where those arguments appear, the first argument about racism is innate is in the work of Winthrop Jordan, who's a historian who wrote a book um, in uh, the late 60s, White Over Black, American Attitudes Towards the Negro, 1550 to 1812, I believe. This is the counter. The, yeah, all this doesn't matter. Racism's innate, right? And he calls it an unthinking decision. Uh, the second argument is more sophisticated because it comes in its in its most articulate form from a fellow named Edmund S. Morgan, professor emeritus from Yale, uh, a well-respected historian, president of the Organization of American Historians, and he writes a very important book, American Slavery, American Freedom, which covers much of the same ground that Allen does and does a very good job on it. This is not a mean-spirited attack on Morgan, but at key point, or Morgan argues there were too few free poor to matter in Virginia. Europeans, poor Europeans, and that is not the case. And we've always had, historically, we've had poor, poor whites, if you will, down south. That is the case where I, the other person I run on, Hubert Harrison, comes from St. Croix. That's the case in St. Croix. That's the case in Jamaica, in uh, Barbados, in the Anglo-Caribbean. And Alan makes distinctions. That's why he refers to what develops here as racial oppression and there as national oppression. So those are the two arguments that Alan is taking on. Now, one other thing I want to mention is um, on the unthinking decision, because ultimately that's really a key one, because that's the one everybody's been so ingrained with in this, and to think in terms of phenotype, you know, and, and, and uh, so Virginia passes laws implementing this, you know, moving to, for, continually moving towards the development of this white race. And one of the laws they pass is, um, it takes away the right to vote for free African Americans, right? There's still free African Americans in Virginia. Even in England, they don't understand. And they write back to the colony and say, why are you doing this? These people, aren't, you know, they should be able to vote. And so Gooch, a fellow named Gooch, is the governor of Virginia, so he has to break it down to them how we do things here, you know? And he writes, uh, well, we did this to fix a perpetual brand on free Negroes and mulattoes. And Alan, after he documents all this in detail. He says, surely that was no unthinking decision, which is Jordan's phrase, right? Um, so again, this is very important. Now, another important ingredient of Allen's work, and it starts from this early analysis, and he goes back to the English roots and the development of capitalism in England, you know, in the 1400s, 1500s, the enclosures, the closing of the monasteries, the struggles, um, and then how Virginia gets set up on a capitalist basis, tobacco production. And so one of his major theses, which is a major break from traditional U.S. labor history, is his understanding that slavery is capitalism, slaveholders are capitalists, 
and the chattel bond laborers, European or African American, are proletarians. The notion of enslaved black laborers, proletarians, has been one that has been uh, run through very many famous uh, black uh, intellectual activists. Allen initially took his insights from W.E.B. Du Bois in one of his major unpublished works is called The Kernel and the Meaning, and it's drawn from Du Bois's um, a passage in Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, a 1935 book which reshaped a lot of our understanding of U.S. labor history. And in that work, Du Bois writes that the white labor movement never had the intelligence to see in black slavery and reconstruction the kernel and the meaning of the labor movement, right? Uh, before, Harris, uh, before Du Bois does that, Hubert Harrison, the fellow I write about, who's the outstanding black radical of the early 20th century radical intellectual, is called the father of Harlem radicalism, uh, and he, for a while, was the leading black activist in the Socialist Party. And he similarly, back in the journals, in major theoretical pieces in the Socialist Press, describes the black labor as the ultimate exploited, kind of the quintessential proletarians, right? C.L.R. James. And at, in, in the art, an article I've written, The Developing Conjuncture and Insights from Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen on the centrality of struggle against white supremacy, I go through a number of these famous writers and authors and historians of the South, Gray, um, uh, Phillips, you know, a number of people who all are very clear this is capitalism. And if this is capitalism, Allen then goes to the next step. If this is capitalism, if the slave owners are capitalists or the plantation owners are capitalists and the ch labor force is chattel bondage, uh, chattel bond are, are proletarians, maybe not originally, maybe the original, but they're reduced to this status, right? And this is what's now imposed then that redoes so much of labor history. And amongst other things, what it does is it provides us an opening to understand and see both the centrality of the African-American struggle to our general struggle in this country, but the key role that African-American laborers have played in labor history in this country. It tears the cover off many white labor betrayals of black labor, uh, particularly a, a lot of the, when I was growing up, a lot of the history I was being fed, U.S. labor history was starting in the early 1800s to the birth of the labor movement. Uh, but black workers were outside the labor force, so it wasn't really a betrayal when they didn't, when the European American workers didn't support abolition or anything like that. Of course, black laborers supported abolition. They didn't have any problem supporting it. Or in England, the Chartists, you know, supported the labor, labor class movement, right, supports abolition. But uh, this assumption that somehow it was not in European American laborers' interest to support um, African American. So it tears the covers off. But another important point that Allen makes is that it's only by going back to the colonial period that we can understand the origin of this white race thing, right? And that we, it's very important for us in our generations now to understand this and to see it for what it is, a ruling class social control formation. And the only way that that can be understood, he, he's arguing, is to go back to see how it's set up and for what purposes, right? For ruling class social control. Um, and he's really posing a challenge to what he calls the great white assumption. The, you know, just an assumption that this white thing always exists, that there's something to it and uh, uh, that it's, it's just there, it's automatic. And then when I grow up, in the period I grow up, 1960s, uh, in that struggle of civil rights struggle, black liberation struggle, there's a move away from Negro, right? It's a new generation, new period, and they're posing a challenge. And uh, there's move to uh, black, uh, African American, African, you know, va va variations, but uh, they, they uh, move away from Negro again as a progressive step forward and, you know, helping to push the struggle forward. I'm pretty clear, um, I myself, that there's nothing positive in identifying as white. And we have to challenge, um, we have to challenge what does that mean? What is it? Um, again, my experiences, and I've been fighting, uh, uh, you know, affirmative action issues, lots of issues related to this for many years. But in the early 1970s, some of the main cases that we used to challenge affirmative action, the Bakke and the Weber case, Weber in, in terms of labor, Bakke in terms of uh, admissions, college admissions, are premised on this notion of white rights, right? I think it's all got to be challenged. And I think for European Americans, as part of the struggle against white supremacy, um, 
we, we want to understand the origins of the term, the concept, what this thing is. Uh, Alan also, just to distinguish him from some other people, in the academy now, he's the founder of the notion of white privilege, but Alan's notion of white privilege is rooted in race and class analysis in the 1960s. He writes pamphlets which shake SDS, national SDS winds up declaring a wall, uh, an all-out national a uh, uh, challenge to white skin privilege in 1969, New York Times, has a feature article on it. But this is not the white skin privilege many people today know. If you go to Wikipedia today, you'll believe that white skin privilege starts with the invisible knapsack and Peggy McIntosh in 19... Nah, it's got its origins many years before, and it's rooted in race and class analysis, right? When Alan writes the origin, the second volume uh, the or uh, of the invention of the white race, it's the origin of racial oppression in Anglo-America. He emphasizes singular, origin, like Darwin does the origin of species, or Engels, the origin of the family. He goes, the singularity is important because it emphasizes my message that the origin of racial oppression is in class struggle. It's a, it's a ruling, it's, it's crucial to labor history, right? So I, I think these are all important things for people to think about, you know, because this is a long struggle, and I think we're far from where we want to be in it, right? Uh, so we, we've got to fight on many fronts, and what I try and do, you know, in my own life and with the people I function with, you know, we try and challenge class domination, we try and uh, gender oppression, but I a particular focus on, on white supremacism because it's, I believe it's so, so crucial to how the ruling class maintains control in this country uh, and you fight it in practice you fight it ideologically historically in all these areas you know you fight these struggles one other thing about Alan's work that I think is important for labor history and this is um, again these are in the articles I write about it but all of this is on my web page so people can find and they can find his original documents but when he first sets out he doesn't start out writing about the invention of the white race. He's trying to address the question, how do we explain the relatively low level of class consciousness in this country compared to particularly other European capitalist countries? And he reviews the uh, previous labor history and labor historians by left and labor historians and general historians. He argues that they put together a general consensus, a six-pronged rationale, and he goes through each of the six prongs, the heterogeneity of the workforce, the free land safety valve, you know, he goes through these things. And he argues that each and every one on close inspection is shown to be shaped deeply by white supremacy and more myth than reality. The free land wasn't really going to laboring people, the railroads were gobbling, you know, uh, whatever issue we look at. And heterogeneity, rather than being a weakness, maybe was a strength in many ways, right? Um, and so he goes through all that which is an important thing, but then he looks at, and this is crucial, he looks at the three previous major crises in U.S. history, those of the 1870s, the 1890s, and the 1930s, when laboring people and people at the bottom of society began to come together to push for changes from below, and he makes the very important argument that in each and every one of those periods of struggle, what the ruling class did, to, what they turned to to beat back struggle from below was appeals to white supremacy. Now, I'll give examples from the Depression because I think they're very clear and they're more recent. But if we look at the Depression, um, we look at a fellow named Ira Katz Nelson up at Columbia University who's written a book when affirmative action was white. And he basically makes the argument that each and every federal program from the 1930s into the 60s was shaped in a white supremacist fashion. So if we look at the national labor, the labor legislation, National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, even Social Security until 1951, they're all shaped in a white supremacist fashion. Why and how? They exclude domestic and agricultural workers. That's 75% of your black labor force down south, right? 60% nationwide. You look at relief, it's federal money, but it's controlled locally, it meant great disparities down south. We right here, as we do this interview, are in the New York area. Another big thing was the GI Bill. Under the GI Bill, you can get a home with zero down payment and low interest loan. Statistics for the New York, North Jersey area are 67,000 GI loans were awarded. Less than 100 go to families of color. That's how you get the ring of white suburbs around New York and every other city in this country. And the fourth one, which I would love to see more labor historians and students of labor history pay attention to, is, I think, crucial. And that is the unemployment ratio.
As long as I've been alive, as long as anyone in this room has been alive, the black to white unemployment ratio has been two to one or some variant of that, right? But it wasn't always that way. In 1929, at the start of the Great Depression, the black to white unemployment ratio was one to one, which makes sense if you think about it because black people are brought here to labor, right? It's only after those programs of the New Deal and the post-war employment stuff that by 1947, the black to white unemployment ratio is two to one, and it's basically remained that way in some or some close variant ever since. There's much more in this analysis, but it's in, again, in Alan's work and in my work on Alan, I cite people to the original sources. When Alan's last book was toward a revolution in labor history, and he starts paying particular attention going back through all the 19th century and how labor how the labor and working men's association didn't support abolition, how the National Labor Union didn't support demands coming out of the Black South in Reconstruction period. He goes through all of this. And my work in, is focusing on the 20th century, on Hubert Harrison and the Socialist Party gets into that. But I, I think in terms of current struggles, I am very convinced that the, the struggle against white supremacy is central to struggle in this current period, as it has been historically, uh, we, we want work. We want European American workers to identify as workers, not as whites. Right? We want. We want. We want to emphasize the worker, and we want to break from that white thing because the white thing serves ruling class interests. Right? Now, I did 33 years in the post office, and I have on my web page, and it was posted someplace. I, you know, I've got actually lots of material which I have to. Um, write on, and I, I can speak from the postal experience as one a concrete example, but first I want to talk about the work we did in the post office, and uh, from the uh, early 80s on for a, a pretty lengthy period, I, I was elected head of one of the unions at a big 4,000 worker postal facility in Jersey City, the Bulk Mail Center, big facility, um, mixed workforce, and um, Jersey City, you know, working class town, mile and perimeter, big, big it's factory, it's a big factory. And um, we uh, waged campaigns, and we're putting out bulletins every week. We set up committees. We got the Women's Committee, the Grievance Committee, the Health and Safety. But every issue we looked at came from this perspective, uh, which I learned from Hubert Harrison, the other person I write about. And every issue we looked at, how is white supremacy shaping this issue? Because there's not an issue you can, uh, you can touch in the workplace or in society in the U.S., where white supremacy is not a shaping factor in that. In my longer article, I go through, um, you know, every area, employment, health care, life expectancy, incarceration, we, you know, we can go over them. And what Hubert Harrison, who I'm, whose biography I'm completing the second volume on now, that early 20th century activist, he wrote way back in uh, 1912, 100 years ago, he, he goes, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. And a touchstone is an extraordinary metaphor because a touchstone is a black stone. You rub it against gold to see if the, if the metal is really what it's supposed to be. And any issue we look at in society, I think we want to approach from that perspective. We want to look. In the workplace, we'd look at discipline. Two workers, same offense. Black worker might get twice to the, the, get a two-week suspension. White worker gets a one-week, right? Um, the the uh, light duty work for pregnant women. The black women treated much more harshly than the, the European American women, right? Every issue we looked at, health, you know, work conditions in the workplace. It's not hard to find. I mean, we fight, you know, on behalf of working people on all these issues, but you have to be aware that there's this other element shaping it, and you have to, as a, a central part of your work, go after it. But we were steady. It wasn't we waited for incidents and then we got to jump, you know, through the roof about, oh, look what happened here, there. We were steady, you know, making it part of everybody's life. So it's wonderful work. I think the work, I, it pushed, we led the statewide anti, we helped coordinate the statewide anti-apartheid struggles. In Jersey City, which is racially polarized, like parts of New York, parts of Brooklyn people may be familiar with and things like this, Jersey City, Bayonne, there's a lot of racial polarization. At, at one point, we had 3,000 out of 4,000 workers in this facility wearing anti-apartheid buttons. It was staggering. You know, it is possible. So I think it's possible to do this. I think this is the key to moving forward because I think the analysis that Harrison hints at, that Alan describes in more detail about white supremacism, racism, however it's being called, being the major retardant to class consciousness in this country is true. It's, we, we've got to deal with it. 
we're not getting any place unless we deal with it, any place significant. And I think it can be done. So I'm very optimistic, and I base it on practical experience. Now, one other thing uh, I want to use, an, uh, just to enlighten uh, listeners, another example of how the ruling class turns to white supremacy in response to labor struggle. Uh, I was in the Postal Service, and the big postal strike of 1970 was keyed in the inner cities of Chicago and New York. And it was particularly Chicago had a very high percentage black and Latin workers in their workforce, as did New York, very high. And um, back then, Wall Street ran on paper. Business Week did a 28-page special. You know, what's going on here? Because they couldn't get their paper to run. And Nixon's the president, and he's catching hell, right? Nixon is catching hell. So the ruling elite has got to do something about this. To make the story a little short, what their response was, there are several aspects of it. One is um, the uh, Nixon sets up a... Uh, Postal Board of Governors to act as a buffer between, because it was, he was directly had an answerable at that time, so now he has somebody he can blame, the Board of Governors, right? That's one thing he does. A uh, second thing they do is they recognize certain unions for, as a matter of fact, to make it more complicated for organizing, uh, the one union they don't recognize, the one group that wants representation rights, is the National Alliance of Postal and Federal Employees, which is a 95, 99% black organization that had started in 1913 when Woodrow Wilson became president in uh, uh, segregated federal workplaces, a number of federal workplaces, and a lot of other things. And they'd been around. So they didn't recognize them, but they recognized the rural letter carriers, the letter carriers, the American postal workers, and the mail handlers, which was the union I was. But the mail handlers was taken over by Liuna, which is a mob-controlled union. This is laborers. The shirt I have on, I brought that for a purpose. Um, and laborers, in 1986, government did a big report, one of the four big mob-controlled unions in the country, right? So it's like willingly let organized crime come into your postal workforce, too. And it, this particular had much to do with the mail handler health benefit plan, which is second biggest in the federal sector. There's all kinds of entangling interest. But here's the third, another thing that they did, besides everything I've described, and this is crucial. The Postal Service, and there's a lot of this in the congressional record, they turned to a new system for, for working the mails, a hubs and spokes system similar to what the airlines run. They built 21 bulk mail centers. So I work in the bulk mail center. It was originally called New York International Bulk Mail Center. It's 10 miles from Harlem, 12 miles from Bed-Stuy, 12 miles from Newark, all these centers of black population. But it's in Jersey City where the public transportation is horrible, and they go from the New York City postal workforce makeup of 65%, 60% black and Latin, to 15% in Jersey City. Every bulk mail center in the country, they build 21 bulk mail centers. They're all named for big cities, but they're outside. The one for Chicago is in Cicero or Cairo, one of these places where the Klan marched, right? And it's a, it's a conscious turn to a whiter workforce. This is in the early 1970s, but you read in the congressional records, why did they do it? And you see these, it's code words sometimes. Oh, we got to go back to those workers we used to have, you know, and things like that. But again, it's part, I think, consistent part of the, not that it can't be struggled against, because we did, we, we waged some very good struggle against it. But so that's from my own personal experience, one place. But overall, in answer to your question, I think for the labor movement, for working people, you know, for people from below in society, we want to wage that struggle. Class, it, you know, class interest clear. We want, want on behalf of poor and working people. But we have to understand that white supremacy is central to how the ruling class maintains control. It's key to what they're going to use to try and divide us. We have to struggle against it daily. And we have to know another key point Alan makes is how in the key periods, that's what they really turn to. So we have to be ready as we start having these overtures coming together. That's what they're going to come at us with and try and break us. So.